to the Stephen Paget Memorial Lecture. This lecture celebrates the life of Stephen Paget, who passionately believed that a greater understanding of physiology would lead to better medical advances. He was the founder of the Research Defence Society, which later became UAR. And this year, we're delighted to celebrate the 83rd Paget Lecture, adding Professor Dame Nancy Rothwell to our long and eminent list of lecturers. Nancy is President and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Manchester. Alongside her outstanding past and present professional achievements, which you can find in today's programme, Nancy was also Chair of the Research Defence Society, UAR's predecessor, from 2004 to 2007. She just told me she didn't know when it was. Now you know. Okay. <coughs> Nancy maintains an active research group. For the last three decades, her research has concentrated on neuroscience, spanning from cell biology and animal research right through to clinical work. Animals have always played an important role in her research. Her early work focused on weight loss and metabolism in disease, but when she discovered that blocking cytokine action could reduce not only metabolism and weight loss, but also brain damage in an animal model of stroke, she switched field to concentrate on stroke research. Her current research focuses on the role of inflammation in brain disease, and she's identified the role of cytokine interleukin-1 in diverse forms of brain injury. Her recent studies have begun to elucidate the mechanisms regulating interleukin-1 release and its action, and her group is currently conducting clinical trials of an interleukin-1 inhibitor in stroke. Since somebody in the UK has a stroke once every five minutes, we hope that this will be successful and lead to benefit to patients from her work. So I'm delighted to introduce Dame Nancy Rothwell for her lecture, A Stroke of Bad Luck. Nancy. So thank you very much indeed, Jeremy. I don't need to give my talk now. You've summarised it perfectly. Um, it's really a great honour to be uh, invited to give the Stephen Padgett Lecture. I, I hosted the lecture, of course, for three years when I was um, president of the Research uh, Defence Society. Now I know the dates. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you um, a very brief background um, uh, of my, my research uh, and, uh, on animals in particular, with the main focus on our research on stroke, uh, particularly addressing the issue of the relevance of animal studies in that and translations to patients. And I'll briefly mention um, the importance of public engagement, which has been a passion for me since I was uh, a PhD student. Um, apparently, when I was two, I declared that my goal in life was to be a famous scientist. This is me age two, avidly reading It's Lancashire Life, actually, uh, not a scientific journal, but then I forgot about that. Um, you've heard a little bit about the background that's relevant to this lecture. Um, I conducted animal research as an undergraduate in my project, a PhD student and beyond, uh, and I've done many presentations on uh, the value of animals in research, um, including public um, lectures and television. I was the director of the University of Manchester Animal Facility for many, many years, and I'm delighted that we were one of the first to sign up to Concordat and indeed invite many visitors into it. And then you've heard some of the other things. Um, I was um, a founder of the Biosciences Federation Animal Welfare Group, and that then became the Royal Society of Biology, a very active group. And I was chair of the National Centre for Three Rs uh, Grants Committee. And I do want to acknowledge um, uh, many organisations who contributed to the position we're in today of a very different approach to animal research and to animal welfare, including, of course, UAR, those that have been mentioned, and the National Centre, which has done a great deal. So you heard briefly that uh, I got into stroke research entirely by accident. Uh, my early research um, with Mike Stock, and by the way, my teeth were different because he broke them playing squash uh, one day, as your PhD supervisor does. Um, and we were interested in how body weight is regulated. Why do some people get obese and some people stay lean? And indeed, um, we were looking at it slightly differently because, of course, um, everybody is aware of energy balance in mammals and animals as well as in physical um, settings where energy intake must either equal energy expenditure, mostly as heat, or there will be a change in body energy content. And the predominant view at the time was that obesity was largely as a result of excessive <coughs> energy intake and indeed above expenditure, which of course it must be. But what we were interested in was whether also energy expenditure could be regulated such that um, higher levels of heat production could allow some animals and indeed people uh, to maintain weight even when intake goes up. 
And indeed, I was the subject of an experiment during my PhD when we had to eat 5,000 calories a day for three weeks. I did gain weight, I gained uh, about five kilos, and lost it again in the following three weeks. There are members of that study who were obese from the moment it finished and are still obese today. And actually it's got worse. Um, and so they don't thank Mike Stock for that. Um, but largely what we did was to um, study thermogenesis, and in animals it was recognised that a specialised tissue called brown fat uh, can help them keep warm in the cold through high metabolism, uh, and we wondered whether humans could do the same. And indeed, this was then at the time the subject of a BBC Horizon <laughs> programme called The Fat in the Fire. And before the programme went out, and this was 40 years ago, um, there was a big debate as to whether we should show all of the scenes or not. Um, and indeed, uh, we did. Uh, and we did, of course, get complaints and lots of uh, hate mail about it. Not about me shopping, but of course about the use of animals. This is Deirdre, by the way, um, who, who ended up being um, a pet rat. But nevertheless, um, we continued with that research. And then um, a few years later, I decided I was going to move uh, from Manchester to Manchester, where you may have gathered I'm from the north of England, uh, and then went on to a chair in physiology, and decided that I had to carve out something of my own research career, that rather than just working on obesity, I had to work on something slightly different. So as a metabolic physiologist, which is what I knew all about metabolism, I didn't change completely. I decided instead of working on why do people get fat, I worked on cachexia, which is why is it that in disease there is such extreme weight loss. And to cut a long story short, we did studies on animals and on patients that demonstrated, as had been shown by others, that there is a very high metabolic rate in many diseases, particularly when you think that patients are often eating less than they would do normally. And of course we know this from the key hallmark of disease, and particularly infection, which is fever. And that fever has achieved a rise in body weight, partly through reducing heat loss, but also through increasing energy expenditure. <coughs> And this is where uh, the chance experiment came along. Um, we had an animal model of stroke that a colleague was using, and I had a hypothesis that the high metabolism in these animals was due to inflammation in the brain. And so we used a blocker of inflammation. And indeed, the metabolism was reduced, and uh, the animals lost less weight. And I wrote this up later in a series in Nature called um, uh, Changing, and it was... Uh, called the, the one last control experiment, because the last control experiment we had to do was to check that the intervention was simply blocking the high metabolism and wasn't reducing the damage caused by the stroke. And of course we found out that it dramatically reduced the damage caused by the stroke. So within a period of six weeks, I decided to change fields completely, to move away from metabolism and into neuroscience and stroke. And from being a platform invited speaker at conferences, I ended up having to pay and go and learn and reread my undergraduate neuroscience textbooks. But for anybody considering changing fields, it's hugely invigorating to change because you have no baggage with you whatsoever. So I started working on stroke. And as you've just heard, this is a massive clinical condition. Across the world, it's the second leading cause of death. And it is the leading cause of neurological disability. And we have got a little better at treating stroke, but we're still not particularly good. So down here, this is stroke. Here is death. And here are all the other neurological conditions. So very briefly, and I recognize you're a mixed audience of, of um, eminent um, and very knowledgeable scientists and those with less background, so I'll dip in and out of, of things. Um, in case you're not familiar, <coughs> stroke is simply defined as a reduced blood flow to part or parts of the brain, and critically, therefore, reduced oxygen. In the UK, it is actually the third greatest killer. And it can be caused by a number of different factors. There can be blockage of an artery supplying a part of the brain. That's the most common, as depicted here. And the territory supplied by the artery then has reduced oxygen. It can result from a brain hemorrhage, an artery bleeding. Um, it can result from poor general circulation, from heart failure, from respiratory failure, and of course in babies from birth asphyxia quite commonly. Um, and this is uh, a condition where during birth normally there's restricted oxygen supply um, to the, the fetus, often resulting in severe impairments. So what, where, what, are the current treat sorry, what are the current treatments we have? Well, actually very few. The key one is this one, thrombolysis, using an enzyme, a tissue plasminogen activator, just the clot. And the result, if you can see here, is an occluded artery in the brain of a patient, and here after TPA, 
a reperfusion. When TPA works, it is unbelievable. It is amazing. Um, and indeed, when it was first licensed, um, there was a consideration of how the story of TPA would be promoted in the USA because many patients who came into hospital with a stroke, they didn't rush in. And so you may have heard that it was um, at the story of a patient given TPA was shown on the medical uh, drama, TV drama ER. And there was a patient who came in with paralysis down one side, couldn't speak, gave them TPA and walked out an hour later. Um, but the trouble is that episode of ER was shown in the UK before TPA was licensed. So lots of people who slept on their right arm or something uh, were coming into hospital. But nevertheless, TPA has transformed the acute treatment of stroke. More recently, mechanical movement of the clot, uh, endovascular thrombectomy, is also showing very positive signs. But we have to bear in mind, these treatments are available to less than 20% of patients. And there are two reasons for that. If there's any uncertainty about whether it may be a, been a bleed rather than a clot, then you don't obviously give something that's going to unblock the clot. And secondly, um, because there is a time frame during which TPA is effective, and it's really only up to about six, possibly eight hours. And many stroke patients don't even know when they had the stroke. They may have woken up in the morning or they may have been on their own. So we're still left with a problem with stroke as a massive burden. What we have had advances in is stroke, uh, specialised stroke units, managing stroke, reducing infections, giving um, treatments that limit the cause of that stroke, such as aspirin, treatment for high blood pressure, and so on. But honestly, where we are, it's not in a particularly good place. It is, as I mentioned, a massive clinical, social, and economic burden uh, with limited treatments, major failure of clinical trials, as I'll come on to in a moment, Little interest now from major pharmaceutical industry and very, very low government funding. If you look at the funding per person who's had a stroke relative to some other diseases, <coughs> it is one of the lowest. So why? Were they the wrong targets that were being attempted, uh, wrong animal studies, the wrong patients, the wrong trials? And the answer to that is probably yes uh, to all of them. There has in recent years been um, a, a really uh, systematic approach to animal research on stroke. And I do want to acknowledge um, the work of Malcolm McLeod uh, from Edinburgh, who's done a great deal of work on uh, preclinical studies. And he published this um, quite some time ago now, um, tests in vitro and in vivo of potential treatments, over 1,000 tested in animals, over 600, the numbers are even bigger than this now. Um, effective in vivo, <coughs> nearly 400, that's nearly 400 different treatments were effective in animal studies one came through positively in a trial, and that's TPA. So that does start to beg the question, which I've thought about many, many times, are we doing the wrong animal studies? And I think I can say in this audience that we, it's something we should question all the time. Are we doing the right animal studies? Have we got the right animal models? So uh, what went wrong? Um, I think there are a number of things that went wrong. Um, there was a focus on the brain. Why not? Stroke is a neurological disease, but actually it's a cardiovascular disease. Almost always it originates outside the brain. The fact that the organs affected is the brain is secondary. Secondly, and I'll come back to this, there was a tendency to focus on disruption of normal processes <coughs> rather than on specific disease processes. What I mean by that is much of the research was looking at the massive disruption to the release of neurotransmitters, like glutamate, to changes in ion concentration inside cells, like calcium and sodium. These are all critical for normal brain function, but they're incredibly well controlled. And in a stroke, there is a massive disruption, thousands of fold change. When you step back and think about it, the task of blocking that thousands of fold change while leaving that little bit that's critical for normal function intact is a huge <coughs> undertaking. And in fact, all of those approaches failed. There is no doubt that the animal studies had been uh, lacking. Failure to account for comorbidities, failure to properly mimic. Nearly all studies on stroke were done in young male spray glory rats or mice, or mice. So that in itself was a limitation. There is undoubtedly limitations on clinical design because stroke, um, up until recently, was treated like one disease in the way we used to treat cancer. Now it's categorised much more and trials are much more sophisticated. But coming back to the normal versus the disease processes, um, we, we thought about, well, what is a disease process that is unimportant in normal function? And, of course, the classical one is inflammation. 
Um, this is from the t front of Time magazine, The Secret Killer, uh, because, of course, inflammation is well recognised to contribute to arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and so on. But we now realise that inflammation is a key feature, if not a key cause, of a hugely diverse range of diseases, including, interestingly, obesity. And that's changed since the time I worked on obesity, because we now know that fat cells are not dormant storages of lipid. They're very active sites of inflammation. And that is probably one of the factors that contributes to the high rates of stroke and heart disease in obesity. It's not just carrying that weight around, or not even just furring up arteries. It is because they're a, they're a site of major inflammation. And, of course, atherosclerosis, key cause of stroke and cardiovascular disease, is also very much associated with inflammation. Now, we've known about inflammation for thousands of years. We've known about the pain, the loss of function, the redness, the swelling, and the heat. And, uh, but it's only recently that we've started to recognise that this is important in just about every disease that we are aware of. Now, of course, inflammation is a host defence response. It's something really important. It diverts blood to tissues that have either an infection or an injury. It diverts white cells. It activates the immune system. But when inflammation is inappropriate, i.e. it's too severe, it's prolonged, or it's in the wrong place, it's massively damaging. And indeed, it is the cause of many of those diseases. And we know that many of the risk factors for stroke are inflama inflammatory, whether it's chronic inflammatory disease, recent infection or surgery, and this builds up an inflammatory response. Key to inflammation is a whole range of inflammatory molecules, and this is where I had to learn, go back and learn undergraduate immunology again, <coughs> which is a task in itself. And, of course, there are many, many inflammatory molecules. There's complement, um, chemokines, um, there are prostanoids, and so on. But particularly important are the cytokines. And these are interesting, the cytokines, because they're normally produced by immune cells, not always, uh, and they are released in the brain um, during injury. But a key feature of most cytokines is they have little or no role <coughs> in normal physiology. There have been some suggestions of minor roles, but really not particularly significant. The first cytokine that was ever discovered uh, was known as the endogenous pyrogen. Remember my reference to fever. Because it was recognised that since a bacterial infection didn't have to get into the brain to cause that increase in set point that caused the fever, there must be some signal from the infected site to the brain. And so there was a long search for that endogenous pyrogen. In the end, actually, it was isolated from many litres of urine of nuns in a convent who all got an infection at the same time. And they isolated uh, the cytokine that was then known as interleukin-1. <coughs> and it is still considered the first cytokine, and, and by some, uh, particularly those who work on it, the master cytokine. But actually, even interleukin-1 is itself a huge family now of many molecules. And I'm just going to simplify it by presenting the major ones. There are two agonists that activate cells, interleukin-1-alpha and interleukin-1-beta. There are others, but these are the main ones. And rather fortunately for us, there is a naturally occurring interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. As far as I'm aware, it is the only example of a molecule that does absolutely nothing, as far as we can tell, apart from antagonise the actions of another endogenous molecule. Interestingly, these are all formed as precursors, which um, for interleukin-1-beta, it's inactive. The others are active. But this is very important because it has to be cleaved by an enzyme, caspase-1, Caspase 1 is involved in cell death, and when the C. elegans genes for cell death were identified, one of the first things that people were doing when they found the C. elegans death genes was to say, are there any similar mammalian genes? And they found Caspase 1, <coughs> and it does have a role in cell death. And they act on a receptor. Um, there are a number of different receptors. Uh, there must be more than one functional receptor, but it's not known uh, the nature of those as yet, with a very complex intracellular cascade. And there are loads of regulations on interleukin-1, things that regulate the synthesis, regulate the cleavage, <coughs> block the receptor, release the receptor, block the downstream, which you would expect of a molecule that is potentially damaging. So when you activate IL-1, key is that it's deactivated. It tends to be produced very, very locally indeed. In fact, you almost never find interleukin-1 in circulation. It's just in the tissue that is damaged, unlike other cytokines. 
So I'll give you a few examples of this, um, but um, to cut a long story short, after that first serendipitous experiment, when the brain damage was reduced by giving, actually, this interleukin-1 receptor antagonist after stroke, we did a whole series of studies. And what we found was that there's rapid production of interleukin-1 in the brain of animals after a stroke, that administering interleukin-1 increases the damage caused by a stroke, and that blocking IL-1 markedly inhibits injury. And I'll just give you uh, a few examples of, of those in, in some data to illustrate. So in uh, rats, this was. We've used a number of different species. Um, in rats, um, we, we looked at the expression of interleukin-1 and found it occurred very early indeed. And, and it's shown here um, with, uh, and interesting, it was mainly R1-alpha, unexpectedly, the red staining here. And it actually all co-localizes with microglia, um, one of the forms of glia in the brain. And it is actually on uh, the contralateral side as well as the side of the stroke. We administered interleukin-1 to animals uh, to determine if that had any impact on the stroke. And this is uh, assessed either histologically or through MR imaging to determine the size of the stroke in the brain in just the same way as you might use MR imaging in patients. And on the left is uh, animals given vehicle, on the right given a very low dose of interleukin-1. Giving an exogenous agent and seeing an effect in itself uh, proves nothing, of course. But this could be very important because one of the things that makes a stroke a lot worse is an infection. In fact, pretty much all neurological disorders are worse during infection. Now, we can't say for sure, but that might be because there is more interleukin-1 being produced. Patients with multiple sclerosis in particular have much worse symptoms, and patients with dementia also do. But obviously, the more important experiment, which I've mentioned before, was blocking endogenous interleukin-1. And for this, we used the endogenous interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. And here is the total damage in <coughs> vehicle treated, and here markedly reduced. And it reduced it in both the cortex and the striatum. Now, of course, it is possible that the antagonist is doing something else other than just blocking interleukin-1. So we used a, a whole range of other approaches uh, with antibodies, with inhibitors of the enzyme caspase-1, uh, probably most definitively using knockout animals, and these are now mice, in which the genes for interleukin-1-alpha or interleukin-1-beta or both were deleted. And what you see here is if you delete either R1-alpha or R1-beta, there is no effect on the damage because they compensate for each other. If they're both deleted, there's a marked reduction in damage. So this and many other studies by us and, and other people um, did uh, suggest that endogenous interleukin-1 in rodents at least mediates a significant part of the damage caused by a stroke. What, an experiment we did which, which had led to a result we hadn't expected was to see what happens when you delete the gene for the naturally occurring interleukin-1 antagonist. And what we found there was the damage is much worse. So in other words, that naturally occurring antagonist is serving to limit the effects of IL-1. It is actually putting a break on it. And when you look, at, <coughs> look for mutations in the IL-1 family genes and the relationship to stroke or worse outcome, actually most of the mutations you find are in this antagonist. And it, it's likely that the antagonist, which is produced after the interleukin-1, serves to limit its effect, both spatially and temporally. So then, of course, the big question is, how does it work and where does it work? One of the problems in treating stroke is getting drugs into the brain. Although there is a disrupted blood-brain barrier, it may not be enough. So is interleukin-1 just acting very locally, so we'd have to get the antagonist in very locally? Because although it is effective when given peripherally, large doses are needed. So we did some studies to inject very low doses of interleukin-1 peripherally, systemically, in mice, and found that even at doses, this dose here of 10 units doesn't even cause fever, but it does worsen brain damage. And this is actually neurological deficit, which is also worse. So this suggests that even very small doses, you cannot detect that interleukin-1 in circulation, can have an effect on the brain. How is it doing that? Well, we think that one of the ways it's doing it is by mobilizing neutrophils from the bone marrow. And the reason we think that is if we do this experiment and then give an antibody <coughs> To neutrophils, the effect is lost. So here's the brain with lots of neutrophils in it, um, in animals treated with interleukin-1, here with the antibody non, here's the exacerbation by interleukin-1, and when neutrophils are blocked, 
then the damage is not exacerbated. So it looks as though tiny doses can exacerbate uh, the stroke by mobilising neutrophils. But that suggests it can work peripherally, not it does. So the big question is, what about endogenous interleukin-1? Is that mainly peripheral outside the brain, or is it mainly in the brain? And in some heroic uh, experiments by Adam Dinesh when he was a postdoc, he did um, adoptive transfer, uh, bone marrow transplantation. So what he did was he took a classical way of doing this, mice that have interleukin-1 and mice that have none, irradiated them, and then did a bone marrow transplant. So you end up with mice that have got IL-1 in the brain and outside the brain, ones that have got it only in the brain, ones that have only got it outside the brain, and ones that haven't got any. And the surprising result was that actually in all of them, the damage was reduced. So it suggests that both peripheral and brain interleukin-1 contributes to that damage. And actually, the reason for this might be because a major target for interleukin-1 is endothelial cells, the lining of the blood vessels. And this, and I, uh, I apologize, it, it's a slightly complicated slide, the work done by Emmanuel Pinto, he did targeted deletion of the receptor only on endothelial cells in animals. And what he found uh, was deleting it here, just on the endothelial cells, caused a reduction in damage. Um, this is um, just um, immune staining as well, and this is neurological score. So in other words, a key target for interleukin-1 is actually the blood vessels. We know there are other targets as well. So from our um, studies, um, it was shown by us and many more that inhibiting IL-1 through a number of different means um, inhibits damage caused by focal, very localised, or global cerebral ischemia or stroke, whether it was permanent or reversible, experimental traumatic brain injury, chemical damage caused by excitotoxins, animal models of uh, multiple sclerosis, seizures, actually uh, not on here, but animal models of birth asphyxia, and in um, animal models of dementia. In the uh, triple transgenic um, Alzheimer model, uh, it reduces. The mechanisms, which I'm only going to say very, very briefly, appear complex and multiple. So what we think is that in the brain, at least, most interleukin-1 is produced by microglia, it does act on astrocytes to release toxins from astrocytes locally. Interestingly, the effects on neurons are probably beneficial, but it also acts on the endothelium within the brain to cause activation, production of adhesion molecules, and release of chemokines. But also, there is a peripheral inflammatory response to a stroke, which you can see an acute phase response to a stroke, and that, in turn, activates bone marrow to release neutrophils, which IL-1 mediates <coughs> and, again, uh, appears to act to worsen damage. And in terms of downstream mechanisms, I'll say uh, no more than this. Um, <laughs> that's enough, probably. But that's all well and good. But, but you know, are, are the, do these studies have any meaning for stroke patients, particularly given what I've said about everything else has failed? And again, um, uh, Michael McLeod did some interesting studies where if you can't read it, he did a, a meta-analysis of all the experiments done with interleukin-1 receptor antagonists. And he said the animal data supporting R1 receptor antagonists as a candidate drug for stroke are limited and further experiments are required before a trial is undertaken. Unfortunately, we'd already undertaken a trial, but nevertheless, we went back. Efficacy at later time points in animals with comorbidities... And it does say it's more effective when given into the brain than um, peripherally. So that prompted a whole series of studies. If you like, going back and saying, we need to stop just using young male rats and mice, and we need to much more closely mimic the clinical condition that happens in a stroke. And I'll just illustrate um, a few of the things that we did. So this is actually um, showing that when given quite delayed, it's still effective. So um, this is when it was given six or eight hours later, and it's still effective. And actually, you probably can't see it on here, but these are lean animals, and these are corpulent, which I'll show you those in a minute. So it was effective when given at a time after the stroke um, that could be clinically relevant. We also um, then found that it provides long-term recovery. Because a concern is interleukin-1 might be causing the short-term damage, but maybe it's good for repair and recovery, and you don't want to block it. But actually, what we found, and this is um, giving interleukin-1 either at the time of the stroke or 12 hours later, then looking 28 days later, this is the key uh, graph here, 
So this is um, looking at success in the neurological score. Controls here, animals given R1 receptor antagonist are still improved and almost back to normal 30, nearly 30 days later. And actually, it seems that not only does R1 receptor antagonist limit the damage, and that's long term, it actually may promote repair and recovery because it appears to drive neurogenesis, the formation of new neurons, uh, which does occur, although not in large amounts, in the brain after an injury. And obviously, the younger the animal or the person, the more likely it is uh, that they're going to uh, have neurogenesis. So this shows a placebo, an R1 receptor antagonist, and signs here of new cells being formed and when they're counted, the R1 receptor antagonist was causing a significant increase in neurogenesis. So this is, uh, of course, reassuring, but still doesn't answer a number of significant questions that you might want to answer if you were going to take it into clinical trials. And in terms of clinical relevance, we looked at comorbidities beyond the obesity, timing of administration, which I briefly told you, pharmacokinetics, is it going to get to the place which is going to be effective in the right concentrations? Um, does it, is it effective with existing treatments? Does it work when given with TPA? And how do we improve the design of clinical trials? Because otherwise, this might be yet another failure in the long list in stroke. So in terms of comorbidities, when you think of many people who get a stroke, um, they are often uh, obese, they may have diabetes, and they often have atherosclerosis, hypertension, infection, and they're largely old, not all. And indeed, we are actually looking at um, intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage, which tends to occur in uh, younger people. So I won't show you all of the data, but we've modelled all of these uh, in animals and looked at obese animals, diabetic. We've also looked at animals with severe infection. And in each of these cases, the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist is effective. Um, and just to give you one example, here's the uh, corpulent rat here, very corpulent, and the lean one here, uh, which caused a bit of a problem looking after them. Uh, this is the damage uh, in the lean, and this is in the corpulent, and the lower one is animals given the R1 receptor antagonist, and it was just as effective. And actually, um, we then had a big argument about what dose you would be giving to a corpulent rat, which is two and a half times the size of its lean litamate. So we actually dropped it to the same absolute dose, and it still was protective, uh, rather than adjusting for the greater body weight. But then, and I think importantly, what we did was uh, a large cross-lab study, um, funded by the European Union, I have to say. I'll go no further on that. Um, <laughs> It was a great, we had a long series of European um, funded research between a number of stroke labs and we decided what we had to do was each do the experiment in our setting, in our animals, completely blinded. So all, I should have said that now, following all the guidelines, every experiment is double blinded, it's fully randomised, everything is you need to do or should do. And having got involved in clinical trials, there's a lot that you could take back to animal studies that is routine in clinical trials. So what we did was a study in um, Budapest, two separate studies in Calm, one in Lubeck and three in Manchester, different investigator for each study. Uh, there were different um, strains of rats, uh, but you'll see the meta-analysis showed a significant benefit uh, for treatment. So I think that does suggest that it is robust, and I think now um, we have done multiple laboratories. We've done male and female animals, we've done old animals, and we've done comorbidity. So this does suggest, at least, that the data are robust. And thankfully, Malcolm McLeod was happy. Um, did a systematic review and meta-analysis of the efficacy. Um, and uh, he says the only major stand standout remaining evidence required is efficacy of hypertensive animals, which has been done. On the basis of, R1, of evidence currently available, R1 receptor antagonist is an attractive candidate for clinical trial. Yay! <laughs> so... How does this relate to clinical studies, and which we've been doing for quite some time? One of the questions uh, that's been around for a long time is, is inflammation a cause of stroke? Never mind what happens afterwards. And actually, there's, there's good evidence uh, that that is the case. Um, but we'll, we, we also looked at biomarkers for inflammation and risk factors, pharmacokinetics, trial design, and patient selection. <coughs> 
So uh, there's good evidence that there are inflammatory episodes throughout life, whether it's a bout of um, flu or respiratory infection, and that each contributes to a growing inflammatory load. We all get more inflammation as we get older, whether it's a slightly creaky joints or you know, slightly more, I don't recover quite so well. But there was good evidence, not from us, some very good epidemiological studies that showed in older patients who suffered from an upper respiratory tract infection, they had a threefold greater <coughs> risk of getting a stroke or a heart attack in the three weeks after the infection. Now, there could be all sorts of reasons for that, but a, an inflammatory dive might well <coughs> be one of them. And in fact, a lot of research has been done looking at inflammation in the brains of patients, either with stroke or with other conditions, or at risk. So this has involved post-mortem analysis, uh, looking at the expression of cytokines and other inflammatory factors in their brains. It's involved microdialysis or sampling of, of um, brain tissue. Uh, but obviously some of the most powerful approaches are to use imaging. And uh, one example that I'll give you here is using uh, PET and uh, MR imaging. So it's a stroke patient. Um, the stroke is here. This is using a well-known tracer that binds to activated <coughs> microglia. There are newer ones now that are being used. This is PK11195, and microglia are the main source of interleukin-1, and you see the concentration here of activated microglia around the site of the stroke. It's circumstantial, but it does suggest at least, and there have been a number of other studies done, and indeed in dementia as well, but it does at least suggest um, that there is inflammation in the brains of people who've had a stroke. Um, we did a, some very small studies looking at patients at risk, um, and, and we defined risk as having um, significantly raised levels of a key inflammatory marker, but without any neurological symptoms and any obvious ongoing infection. And the marker we use was C-reactive protein. It's a good long-term marker of inflammation. And this just illustrates, it's not definitive by any means, um, again, PET imaging in four patients with high CRP and four with low to normal. These were all older patients in their 70s. Now, what we need to do really, but it's unbelievably expensive, is to get a larger cohort and then ask to the ones with the high inflammation go on to get either dementia or stroke. But the cost of doing that in PET in all of them and then a long-term follow-up is absolutely huge. But in terms of taking what we had done in the lab in animals into patients, we felt we had three key questions to answer. These were the pharmacokinetics. How much do we have to give? Does it get into the brain? Does it need to get into the brain? Is it safe? And is it effective? And I'm going to give you the answer to the first two and only the half answer to the third. I'll warn you now, we haven't got quite to the end of the story. So pharmacokinetics. Um, we first did some studies where we pet-labeled the uh, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. And animal studies suggested that it did get into the brain when you do the imaging. But we wanted to do it in patients, and that's quite difficult to do. So we decided that rather than look at stroke patients, we'd look at patients with some arachnoid hemorrhage. Now, um, this is obviously um, bleeding in the brain. Significant proportion of those patients go on to get a secondary stroke, about 20% get delayed cerebral ischemia in the two or three weeks afterwards. Um, and this just illustrates um, uh, an aneurysm here, um, which often bursts or starts to leak, causing a, a hemorrhage. Uh, with damage here or here, and it's actually not that different. One of the differences, though, between patients who've suffered subarachnoid hemorrhage and those who've had stroke is, firstly, they're very intensively managed, nor normally on a neuro um, neurosurgical intensive care unit, whereas stroke patients until recently have been on general wards, but also that many of them have uh, an extraventricular drain put in. That means the CSF is drawn off because the pressure in the brain goes up because of the swelling, and therefore that has to be relieved. So a drain is inserted into many of these patients, sorry about the gory bits, um, uh, drilled in through here, and this is withdrawn. So we thought this routine sampling could be a way of testing whether or not the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist got into the brain. Now, we had to do this after the initial bleed, and we had to check that there wasn't still a bleed ongoing, because that would just be coming straight in, obviously. What we found uh, in these patients um, was that um, if we looked at uh, plasma, levels go very high very quickly. This is the levels in the CSF. Now, the concentration required in animals to be effective is about here. So enough was getting into the brain. So that suggests that we could get enough into the brain. 
In these patients and in others, we have surprisingly seen almost no side effects of interleukin-1 receptor antagonists, given for at least for two to three weeks. The one we were worried about was opportunist infections, particularly in these very sick patients on neurosurgical uh, intensive care, but really saw either minimal or no increase in infection. Um, so we, we've done a number of um, clinical studies uh, now in stroke and subarachnoid hemorrhage, and I'll just highlight a few of those. Um, in taking it into patients, we knew it was very safe because this drug is actually used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. It's not particularly good compared to, say, TNF antibodies because it's got quite a short half-life. But actually, for stroke, you want a short half-life. For chronic treatment, you want a longer half-life. But there were really very few side effects reported. And there are trials now ongoing with inhibitors of IL-1 in uh, myocardial infarction, in uh, birth asphyxia, in a number of other conditions. We'd done um, prim preliminary cl clinical studies, so we had an idea of um, the feasibility of giving it, and it was given intravenously in the first study. Um, later, it's been given subcutaneously, and we've done pharmacokinetics on that as well. So the first study we did was a phase two study, really just to determine, can it be given, and is it safe? And can we get any indication from biomarkers uh, that it was actually blocking inflammation? It was a fairly small study. This was a number of years ago. So we chose to uh, study a range of biomarkers in uh, the stroke patients, and these are all markers of inflammation, and all suggested that the IL-1 receptor antagonist was indeed reducing the levels of inflammation, which was positive. So if we just look at these four graphs, uh, this one gives neutrophil count in blood, uh, this is total white blood cell count, this is uh, C-reactive protein, and this is interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is interesting. It's another inflammatory cytokine. You find lots of it in circulation. It's downstream of interleukin-1. And one of the reasons we know that interleukin-1 doesn't worsen damage just by increasing temperature is because interleukin-6 also increases temperature, but it's actually protective. It's the opposite. But in each case, the first thing you see is this acute phase response to the stroke. The open triangles here are the stroke patients given placebo. And in every case, there's an acute phase response, which is probably worsening the damage. And in each case, the patients, given the R1 receptor antagonist, the active component, it was largely reversed. It was far too small a study to be powered uh, to get any uh, definitive outcome, but we did look at neurological scores, uh, and these are two different scores. Um, in each case, the white part is fully recovered, uh, the black is dyed, uh, this is lost. Um, and on both measures, it, it did appear that there was um, more uh, patients in the R1RA-treated group uh, that did well. Um, we've then done a larger study um, with uh, biomarkers as primary outcome, and we used uh, interleukin-6 and CRP, the area under the curve, in patients treated with placebo or the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, and in both cases, it met the primary endpoint. We then did a larger study of R1RA in, in acute stroke, and it met the primary endpoint of reduced markers, but there was no clinical benefit. So we asked what's changed. And from the first study, when not a single patient got TPA, all the patients in this trial got TPA. So we are looking into whether there might be an interaction with TPA. And the larger study we're doing now is in subarachnoid hemorrhage. And in fact, I won't go through these, but there are now uh, either ongoing or completed quite a number of uh, clinical studies, um, all led from Manchester, but now uh, multi-centre. And the two big ongoing ones at the present time are a phase two, two study in intercerebral haemorrhage, very serious condition, more rare, and a phase three definitive study in subarachnoid haemorrhage. We chose subarachnoid haemorrhage because of the most recent stroke study. I could have said also that interleukin-1 has been implicated in many different neurological disorders uh, in, and indeed in some psychiatric disorders. It's been implicated in schizophrenia, in depression, in many others. Uh, in some cases there's good evidence and in others there aren't. But just as I finish, um, I do want to say um, a huge thank you to all the people. I just want to say um, a couple of words about public engagement. Um, so large group in Manchester, very large group, um, too many to mention. I'm extremely fortunate that since I became Vice-Chancellor, they let me meddle, so I can still do some research, because there are now eight members of staff at the university who train with me at various different times, four of them are professors, and they do all the hard work, and they're both clinical and uh, scientists, and I go to the lab meetings, I read the grants, I read the final papers, and I sort of meddle when I, when I want to. 
Public engagement, talking about animal research, has always been a focus of what I've done and what uh, this group currently does, largely led by Stuart Allen. They do a huge amount of work with stroke survivors and with the Stroke Association. Um, many uh, descriptions and discussions, we've had stroke survivors come into the animal facility, see exactly what we do. They see the surgery, which is, can be quite distressing. Um, it's now instilled in all researchers. They all take part in it. Very pleased that Manchester won the only gold watermark for the National Coordinating Centre for Public in Engagement, uh, and they talk to schools, uh, the public, and so on. And uh, the animal facility in Manchester is very heavily involved in this and has always been uh, extremely supportive. But I'll leave you with a thought, um, which if you remember what I said when I was two, um, still aspiring to be a famous scientist, and I was given this um, present by somebody a little while ago, and it's somebody who knew me quite well, and I thought it was a, I didn't quite know what to make of it. Um, it says, well-behaved women rarely make history. <laughs> I shall finish there. Thank you. <laughs>
in a response to a very localized injury or a very localized infection. That's what inflammation is good for, when it's very, very localized and it's terminated quickly. But if you think one of the major problems in cerebral malaria, in head injury, in hemorrhage and all of those, it's a really bad thing. But like most things, our immune system is phenomenal and inflammation is phenomenal as long as it's very tightly controlled and there are many controls on it. It's when it seems to go out of control. But I'm often asked a slightly different question is, why have we evolved to have interleukin-1 produced after a stroke when it's so damaged? You could say, use the same argument, that why have we evolved to have all sorts of nasty things produced? Firstly, you could argue that, that many neurological disorders probably occur later in life, so there would have been no evolutionary pressure either way. And secondly, w there is evidence that very small amounts of interleukin-1 are protective to neurons. So it could be that they're protective. And the final thing, and this is highly speculative, um, is you could imagine that actually if you've got damaged cells in the brain, which you know well, that are misfiring, that's a really bad thing. You're better off with them dead, probably, than misfiring. So it could actually be a let's kill these cells. Or it could have been something that emerged in response to um, cells with DNA damage, as in cancer. Um, hiya. I'm just wondering whether or not there were any differences uh, ever seen between male and female animals or patients. Um, Yes, um, in our studies, um, not, not absolutely, i.e. in animals, it's protective in females. You have all sorts of worries about, um, you know, if you use using animals, you've got to worry about oestrocyclin, whether that affects it, and oestrogen is protective slightly um, uh, against stroke. Um, but not fundamentally in terms of um, whether or not um, it works, i.e. protects. In patients, um, stroke tends to be slightly more common in women. Um, so, and hemorrhage tends to be slightly more common in women. Reason isn't known. Just not enough studies done to know if the response to interleukin-1 is any different. Of course, women tend to be much more prone to autoimmune disease. So, might be generally more inflammatory. Uh, much more prone to um, uh, lupus, to rheumatoid arthritis. Not... No, men do get it, but, but there is, tends to be a more inflammatory response. And really interestingly, of course, the time when, when, when women with autoimmune disease um, uh, see an alleviation of symptoms is during pregnancy, and they get immune suppression. MS is slightly more common as well in women. Hello, thank you for such an excellent talk. I actually wanted to ask about your gold award for public engagement. Oh, right. Um, has it, what kind of impact has holding that award had within the university? So I think already, I think, I think we won it because they came and they interviewed staff and students, picked at random without any staff there, so we couldn't pretend. And the questions they asked was, is this held as important? Is it part of your training? Is it encouraged? And generally they said yes. So I think that was there anyway. I think the Gold Award has done two things. One is the pride. People are very proud of it. But the second thing is, when you do find these isolated pockets, and they are isolated, I hope, of the PhD student who says, but my supervisor says I'm too busy doing my research and I haven't got time to go out on you know, Saturday morning and talk about what I do. I say, well, just go and show them this gold award, will you? Um, you know, and they say, well, it won't count for ref. I say, yeah, it will count for impact. Believe me, we happen to know Brian Cox's um, lectures on television got a four-star in ref. So, you know, um, <laughs> well, they double the sale of telescopes. So um, that, that was a good measure actually um, um, but yeah I think it, I think it did um, and others will win it I'm sure but given you know I've always been very passionate about it I say you're not doing this just because you know we say you should do it or the funders say you should do it you are funded by the general public but if you do public engagement you pretty much get better at doing most sorts of uh, presentations. One of the things in one of the faculties the PhD students are asked to do is talk about their research and the audience is uh, the cleaners and the secretaries and they judge and that has two benefits. Firstly it's a public audience with no knowledge and secondly it makes um, the cleaners and the secretaries feel very proud and much more engaged in the research that's going on in their building. And we've done similar things with animal research, talk to them about what we do and then they feel a pride in it. Oh yes, yes, with Jim. You, you, you mentioned your animal research. I did. Uh, quite, quite a lot through it. Did you have any um, animal research experience or did you get feedback on that at all? Did you get any negative 
No, I didn't. I mean, 30 years ago I would have done. I mean, I would have gone into it. I would have done it, but I, I would have thought, oh, goodness, you know, I've got to think about this. And then, you know, the university would have said, ooh, what are you doing? Are you going to talk about it? Oh, God, do we get, need to get you more protection? I didn't really think about it anymore. I know this is Concordia of Openness, this is what UAR's done, what NC3R's, what everybody else has done. I don't really think about it now. I mean, you occasionally get one or two people writing in or, or Twitter comments, you know, how outrageous this is, what you do. Um, but nothing like it used to be, where there was a sense of real hatred and, and, and you know, organised unpleasantness. You know, I don't have special branch visiting me saying, don't park your car there anymore and you need to change your phone number and stuff. It just doesn't really happen. Um, I think I even raised it on Desert Island Discs, actually. But, um, yeah, I didn't worry about it then. No, I didn't think about it. On the back. Oh, Mike. Manchester. <laughs> yeah, he's a plant. Yeah. Who's going to ask me the most difficult question? So I did this. Question, you didn't really. But how do you explain to the general public the fact that you've done thousands of animal studies over the years and we've still only got one target for stroke? That's a very fair question. So Stuart gets this question. Often. I know. I know. Yeah, Stuart Allen is uh, now leads the neuroscience group. First of all, stroke is very, very complicated and very difficult. You think how hard it's been with cancer to get treatments, how long it's taken. And actually, you can get at cancers much more easily. Trying to get at something that happens inside the brain is unbelievably difficult. And I think we've spent a long time learning. And I think it's best to be honest and say, we didn't get it right always. Um, and I think we're doing better now. Uh, so to pretend that actually, oh, it was all fantastic and we did everything brilliantly, I don't think it's the right way. I think I've always found when I'm asked that question is, yeah, we learnt a lot as we went along and we realised we weren't do it, doing it all as well as we could have done. And then they say, well, do you know who you are now? And you say, I can't be certain. The trials might fail and it might still be wrong. And, you know, what do you do then? But I always find honesty is best. Do you, most pharmaceutical companies now would probably want some indication that there's good human genetic evidence that the IL-1 system is important in stroke. Mm. And I guess there is some, but it's there not some. dramatic, is there it? There is some, yeah. Um, uh, I, I just very briefly skipped over the fact that we've done a lot looking at um, uh, polymorphisms in the IL-1 family, uh, and, and others have done as well. And we looked particularly at patients at high risk who did get a stroke. And the two groups we looked at were patients who'd had a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, or a mini stroke, quite a number of which go on to get a major stroke, and ones who'd had subrhinoid hemorrhage and did go on to have a secondary ischemia or didn't, and asked what featured there. So, and we looked for plasma biomarkers as well. Um, we found polymorphisms associated with the promoter region of the R1 receptor antagonist gene suggesting maybe it's not too much R1, but it's too little antagonist. And the single correlate from bio, plasma biomarkers was the ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which, of course, is an inflammatory marker to some extent. That came out of both studies. <coughs> so, yes, but not great. There are extreme mutations, of course, in the R1 family where you get massive inflammatory <coughs> conditions, and R1 array is used in those, um, in extreme hyperpyrexia and things like that. Any more questions? Yes, one here. You mentioned the liver. And we need the mic, otherwise people in the back may not hear you. Indicated there was, oh, sorry. Oh. It's right, I can repeat the question. Um, <coughs> you mentioned the liver, but didn't expand on that, and, but also yes. mentioned that there's the impact of the periphery. Yes. And it's become, well, m more trendy, but also relevant, obviously, in terms of understanding this gut-brain access. And the, yep. The so... Um, what you see after a stroke is the classical acute phase response, and many of the acute phase proteins are produced by the liver. Um, and we think, and some of that happens very fast, we think it must be neural, some of it, because you can actually see it in minutes. Um, so it could be a neural um, supply to the liver. And then, of course, the liver activates a load of other things. But bone marrow experiment that Adam did, he um, denovated um, bone marrow uh, in the leg um, of animals and showed that there was a neural component to that as well. So it's the whole acute phase, you know, stroke is no different to having, you know, breaking your leg. You just get a massive acute phase response in the brain and in the periphery. The surprising thing was that I one seems to be important in the brain and outside the brain. That was, that was somewhat surprising. I guess my question's a little bit broader than the specifics. Um, Nancy, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. 
Um, there seems to be, we, we, we take a, a much greater focus nowadays on mental disease as being something that is actually physiologically difficult, <coughs> pathologically di changing perhaps, and association with inflammation for diseases such as, or conditions such as depression. So is what you're describing here part of that whole story around how we will understand the mechanical changes that take place in mental disease as opposed to just thinking it's people going crazy? Well, well the first thing to say in, in the spirit of honesty is I'm not a psychiatrist, um, and so I should be careful here. I think the evidence for inflammation in um, psychiatric disease like depression is fascinating but not definitive would be my take on it at the moment. Um, and, and you know, you have to rule out the fact they've got some patients might have something else wrong with them that's causing inflammation and they're depressed about it. So, um, but but there, there, there's been some very interesting studies, not done by us, I mean Robert, Robert Dancer did an awful lot of work on depression in animals and on behaviour and interleukin-1 is, is, is a very key driver of what's often called sickness behaviour, which is the fact that you feel depressed when you've got a, uh, some sort of infection, you're sleepy, you don't want to eat, and that is all R1 mediated, uh, or at least uh, block it and you do block it. What hasn't been done very much, and, and of course minocycline and anti-inflammatory is in trials in quite a number of diseases, um, uh, uh, mental health diseases. I've not seen any really big studies, and that, that's not to say there haven't been any, because I, I don't follow it that well, the literature, um, to show that actually there is a very strong correlation between depression and bouts of depression <coughs> and inflammation, or the anti-inflammatory agents. And it's very hard doing these studies because you know, the first research on dementia uh, arose because of the lower incidence of dementia in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, but only if they were on anti-inflammatory agents. Then they did the proactive trials and they couldn't prove it. Now they've done them better and for longer and it is looking like it's true. So it, it's quite, they're quite difficult studies to do, I think. Okay, if there are no further questions then, the first thing I have to do is make sure we all thank Nancy again for a splendid <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not giving more speeches. <clears throat> I want to say something which isn't in my notes. I want to make sure that we recognise the whole of UAR staff who've done a fantastic job, A, in running and keeping UAR going as the wonderful organisation it is over the last year, but also in what they've contributed to putting tonight together. So thank you, everybody, very much. <clears throat>